Good evening, everyone. Thank you for your interest. My name is Chris Carey. I'm one of the uh, psychiatrists that uh, works at the Lurie Center. And tonight we have um, sort of the topic of our lecture is psychopharmacology and autism spectrum disorder part two or uh, psychopharmacology 102. This is um, sort of a companion lecture with a lecture I gave earlier on in the year um, uh, back in March, which we have posted to our to our website that has uh, 101. But if you didn't attend 101, that's okay. We're going to talk about sort of some summary of the results that came from that and, uh, and talk about some new concepts and ideas uh, that can be helpful in terms of thinking about medications and how they can be helpful for mental health issues for kids, teens, and adults with autism. So thanks so much for your interest. If I can avoid talking too much, I will leave time for questions. Uh, and uh, let's get started. I start all of my lectures with a discussion of conflicts of interest. Um, I'm not going to talk about any <clears throat> um, treatment today that has any financial connection to any of my uh, sources of funding, research, or otherwise. So here's what we're going to cover tonight. Uh, we're going to talk about um, common chief complaints. So uh, as a psychiatrist at the Lurie Center, seeing kids, teens, and adults for a number of years now, seven or eight years, um, uh, the topics I'm going to talk about are probably going to be one of the, represent the majority, maybe we might say like 75 to 80 percent of the chief complaints that I hear. These are like common behavioral issues where we might be thinking about, could a medication be helpful? Remember that I always think about medications, especially, psychi especially psychiatric medications, as not being treatments for autism itself. There's no medication that necessarily changes uh, what we think of as being autism or helps with the core features of autism. Uh, medications are meant to treat co-occurring issues, co-occurring mental health issues or behavioral concerns. So it's important when we talk about medicines that we think, what's our focus? What's our target? What are we trying to help um, with with that medicine? So we'll be focused around what our goal is when we talk about treatments. Uh, because in Psychoform 101, we talked about some of the most common uh, treatment approaches. We're going to review those briefly, but we're also going to talk about some less common treatment ideas in terms of medications and also some strategies if we're seeing side effects with the common stuff, with the psychiatric medication choices that have the best research behind them? What are some tricks and tips that might help us work around some of those issues? Um, and we're gonna hold ourselves to a standard of discussing research as the uh, jumping off grounds for any of the recommendations. And I need to hold myself to that standard with any medicine I offer, because medicines carry side effects, they carry concerns. We should always be able to come back to when we can research saying why these medicines are you know, good choices, likely to be helpful, worth the risk. Um, so uh, that's a good jumping off ground for talking about side effects as well. So again, we'll come back to research studies to build the case for why these medicines are good choices. And we'll use vignettes to not make it too dry or too boring. We'll kind of use jumping off grounds of um, some patients. I've changed some of the stories, so it's not actual patients I work with, but sort of changing some of the details to protect people's confidentiality. Uh, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just as a remember, it's worthwhile thinking about medication for here are some common issues where psychiatric medications may be considered. We want medications to be the last resort. We want to try other behavioral interventions, psychotherapy, changes to our routine, academic accommodations, exercise and good sleep. We want to be thinking about these things first before psychiatric medications. However, there are some situations where it's worth prioritizing thinking about a medicine. If mental health or behavioral issues are so severe, they're limiting people's ability to be in the community and be a full participants as much as possible in their life and community inclusion. If behaviorals are limiting people's ability to make use of therapies in school, if we've already tried behavioral treatments, we've already tried psychotherapy and these have not had limited success, these have had limited success despite you know real efforts with um, clinicians we think are good. And if we're really concerned about the safety of our loved ones with autism, the family, the people they care about, the, the teachers, their educators, uh, the staff that are trying to support them, if safety is a concern, then it's worthwhile also prioritizing medicines. So here are some situations where I think about it. Okay, these are gonna be the main topics that we're gonna focus on today. We're gonna go item per item through each one of these main concerns, anxiety disorders, 
motor hyperactivity and inattention, irritability. We'll talk more about what I mean by that. And then ritualized repetitive behavior, one of the more complicated uh, chief complaints that I get. We're going to go item per item, talk about a vignette, give a research study or two, and give a summary slide on what are the common treatment ideas. Maybe we'll take a minute to talk about the most common medicines and how they work. So let's go ahead and get started. Let's start with anxiety disorders. So the first vignette here um, that I want to talk to you about, a I think Jennifer is what uh, I have listed at the top here. 23-year-old woman with autism. She has strong cognitive skills. She uh, was able to complete high school at the academic level of her peers. She has some social challenges related to her autism, some decreased social interest, a lack of reciprocity in relationships that makes it hard for her to develop close relationships. But she's got a lot of strengths, um, but she has a lot of what-if worries. She has a lot of um, rumination around things that might go wrong natural disasters, rare medical conditions. She has a lot of hypochondriasis, worries about aches and pains, whether that indicates a larger medical issue. She can be highly perfectionistic around needing things to kind of be just uh, perfect when it comes to her academics. Um, and it makes everything take a long time. In fact, it's part of the reason she was unable to complete college. Um, she has a constant need, whoops, excuse me, for reassurance from the people around her, around these what if worries, and it's exhausting for the people around her. And she can get irritable and controlling if people don't reassure her. So anxiety is, it gets in the way for her in terms of relationships. Family will try to avoid watching the news in front of her or avoid talking about certain things for getting her upset or anxious. So it very much impacts her life, this sort of generalized level of anxiety. So first standard of care treatment for this type of anxiety, which is kind of generalized anxiety is kind of the picture here, is that of... SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, and what are called SNRIs, serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. And these combined with psychotherapy can be highly effective for anxiety disorders, particularly generalized anxiety, social anxiety disorder, panic attacks. The way these medications work is they block the reuptake of serotonin. So if we think about the nerves communicating with each other in the brain, the different neurons, by releasing neurotransmitters, Serotonin is one of the neurotransmitters that allows for communication between these uh, neurons. And these medicines fool nerves into releasing more serotonin by blocking the reuptake of serotonin, which is one of the, the sort of shutoff systems that nerves have when they've released enough serotonin. So it, it floods more serotonin into the system, and this is found to be correlated with improvement in anxiety disorders. And SNRIs also do the same for norepinephrine, sort of an additional way in which they work. And these medications are standard of care treatment for anxiety, but they carry some problems. And some of the problems they carry is they can be hard to tolerate in kids teenagers, especially um, individuals that are on the spectrum, kids and teenagers that are on the spectrum. There was a research trial, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Um, ben King was one of the authors here referenced at the bottom that this was a research study that looked at SSRIs and found really high rates of side effects in kids that have autism spectrum disorder, um, oh, particularly behavioral side effects, increased energy level, impulsivity, hyperactivity, insomnia, irritability, and a lot of subjects that needed to leave the trial because of these side effects. Um, we know also that SNRIs and SSRIs carry a black box warning for the usage of kids, teenagers, up to the age of sort of transitional age adults into the kind of early to mid twenties. This is a black box warning to watch out for suicidal ideation. A lot of psychiatrists think that this has to do with this particular side effect of increased energy level, impulsiveness, irritability that you're essentially, if you know, if you're causing more mood reactivity, they might come along with suicidal thoughts. And so that can be one of the challenges of prescribing these medicines. So if an individual with autism is unlucky enough to have these side effects, what can we do? Well, here are some alternative options uh, that we can consider that are also can be effective for anxiety. Boosbar, Boosbarone, this medicine works in a different way to increase serotonin uh, tone in the brain. It directly activates parts of the nerves called neurotransmitters that serotonin binds to, kind of fooling the nerve into thinking that serotonin has, has bound to that nerve. And in that way, it increases the, the, the tone and the, um, the, uh, the overall level of activation caused by serotonin. 
then we have mirtazapine, remeron. Mirtazapine has got a much more complex way of working. Again, in a way that's different than SSRIs, it has the nerves inc uh, increase in their release of serotonin and norepinephrine being disinhibited in the way they release these in certain parts of the brain. And then we have Wellbutrin, which works in a totally different fashion to serotonin actually works in, in dopamine. We don't have any research studies of bupropion specifically in autism per se, and this medicine can lower the seizure thresholds. You have to be careful in individuals that have epilepsy, but we do have some research studies for anxiety when it comes to the top two um, medications here. So let's talk about those. This is our first study we're gonna talk about today. It's an open label trial. For those of you who don't know, open label trials are different than placebo control trials. In open label trials, every participant and their family members know that they're getting the real deal medication, which in this case was Boosperon. And that's different than a placebo where there's a group that's getting a placebo and not the real medication. And so they don't know whether they're on medicine or not. So open label trials, you got to take with a grain of salt because there's a possibility for suggestibility. Maybe they got improved. Maybe they improved because they believed they would improve rather than actually getting better. So we take this with a grain of salt, but I'm going to bring up this trial anyway of Boosborough. It was an eight week trial and it included individuals with autism between the ages of six and 16. And they were severe enough with their anxiety that they were hospitalized for it. So that means that some of their, in these individuals, their anxiety might have included outbursts or meltdowns that might've included aggression even. Um, but uh, anxiety was thought to be sort of the core major concern. So these were individuals that were substantially uh, impaired from their anxiety or their life was very affected by it. And they allowed clinicians to sort of um, adjust the dosage of the boost brone based on whether it was helpful or not going up to 30 milligrams about on average and uh, the target symptoms were anxiety. What they found in this trial is that they, an evaluator asked, looked at, ass assessed the individual and to see whether or not they were majorly improved, moderately improved, minor improvement, no improvements, minor worsening, moderate worsening, major worsening. This kind of assessment is called a clinician's global impression scale. And if you are a much improved or very much improved, you're a responder. And so we have the majority of subjects were responders in this trial. Nine were major responders and seven were moderate responders. And this medicine was very well tolerated. Some mild sedation, some mild agitation, some initial nausea that improved with time were the major side effects seen. There was one subject that had chewing movements of the mouth with this medication. Buspirone can in extremely rare cases have mild effects on something called dopamine, which can have effects on abnormal movements. But in this trial, they stopped the boost and those that went away. So the thought was these were really pretty mild side effects considering how much improvement they saw. And by six months, around six months, five or six months, um, all individuals had stayed on the medicine still with benefits. So we take this with a grain of salt. However, the tolerability is really pretty impressive compared to SSRIs, bringing this up as a nice option to consider. The second study I want to talk to you about was a pilot study. It was done by our group here. Uh, Chris McDougall was the lead author, and it was a pilot trial. So pilot trials don't have as many people as we'd like to have with them, but it's sort of a, a proof of concept. Is the medicine tolerable enough for us to consider it and move forward with it? This was a 10-week trial of mirtazapine. That was the seven, second medication I told you about, this one back here, the mirtazapine or Remeron. For this trial, 30 subjects participated between the ages of 5 and 17. The majority were on mirtazapine, but it did have a placebo arm. Now, this trial, um, both groups, the placebo group and the mirtazapine groups, both showed improvement in anxiety. And the level of improvement in mirtazapine, while it was at a trend level better, it wasn't significantly better, enough to call it a positive trial. So why am I bringing this up as a trial? Why I'm bringing it up is because it was way more tolerable than SSRI medications were. Mirtazapine, in fact, had a much lower level of discontinuation rate. Discontinuation, when it was seen with mirtazapine, was due to appetite increase, which happened to about half of participants in this trial. So that's a concern with this medicine. However, uh, the benefit with this medication was that behavioral side effects were much less often. Opening this up as a potential option. The, um, op the uh, pilot nature of the trial suggested that while it was just a trend level of improvement, maybe they'd see more improvement if they did a larger trial and the tolerability brings it up as a, as a nice option to consider. So it's initial data only, 
but it suggests this might be a strategy, again, for people who can't tolerate SSRIs. Okay, but let's come back to what's our general approach when it comes to anxiety disorders. So first-line treatment is going to be either an SSRI, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitor, which we talked about, but if we're really concerned about behavioral side effects, we might start with buspirone first because we know we're talking about a very tolerable medication. And then we've got in our back pocket options like mirtazapine, effective for anxiety in other studies of neurotypical populations and evidence for good tolerability in autism. And then we've got some other backup ideas, guanfacine or clonidine. These medicines kind of do the opposite of the fight or flight response. And in last resort situations, a medicine called Seroquel or quetiapine, an antipsychotic but fun found to be very helpful in anxiety. Okay, so let's switch gears now and talk a little bit about motor hyperactivity and inattention. You'll see our theme here. We're using a vignette, then we're jumping into talking about what standard of care treatment and then some ideas for if standard of care treatment causes problems. And for this vignette, we're talking about Alex, a seven-year-old uh, with autism, very history of really low weight, extreme picky eating. He's constantly movement in movement, which may be part of the reason why Alex is so thin. Um, and he sitting down is just not in Alex's wheelhouse. Uh, and he's always been that way, always been in constant movement. And teachers have always expressed concern about distractibility in Alex and the ways in which it gets in the way of occupational therapy, speech therapy. These things make the progress way slower from Alex for Alex, or his teachers think it makes the process much slower. Constant need for movement breaks. Lots of excessive talking or blurting. Lots of unsafe climbing, so the parents have to watch him very carefully to make sure he doesn't hurt himself. Waiting is a real challenge for him. Entertaining himself with unstructured time with a leisure skill is just really tough for Alex. And kind of an oh, extreme sort of curiosity, kind of getting into everything and, and sort of you know, can be a little on the destructive side, although Alex doesn't mean to be that way. Uh, he can be a little bit of a bull in a china shop. Um, so what are first level treatments for hyperactivity? Well, um, first level treatments are oftentimes stimulant medications. Psychostimulants fall into two major classes, methylphenidate and mixamphetamine salts. And so there are many, many, many different stimulant medications. They're all essentially either methylphenidate or mixed amphetamine salts. And they come in short acting and long acting and liquid and patch and all different banana flavor, all sorts of different formulations, but it's really only one of these two medications. And they all work in a similar way. They increase dopamine in the prefrontal cortexes of the brain, the areas of the brain responsible for inhibiting impulses. And they um, serve to have each nerve release more dopamine in those particular regions of the brain. But they carry a caveat in autism. Despite there being, them being first-level treatment, after you consider accommodations and, and things like that in school, despite them being first-level treatments and very effective, Studies of these medications in kids with autism find they have major tolerability problems. One in four kids in a trial of stimulant medicines with autism had to drop out of the trial because of side effects, particularly increased irritability, increased agitation, kind of similar to what we were seeing with um, the SSRI medications. So are there any ways to work around that? In 2017, there was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial that was done that looked at what happens if you use a long-acting version of stimulant medications rather than what previous studies have done, which is using short acting versions. And this was uh, 27 kids. It was a not a double blind placebo control trial. It was a trial where kids were randomized in either a low dosage of long acting methylphenidate or a medium dosage of um, long acting methylphenidate, starting really low, five milligrams, um, and then increasing by only five milligrams a week until you could get to a dosage that was tolerable for the kid and, and got as high to that target dosage as possible. And here are the results. So this is a small graph here, so I'll walk you through it here. This is um, on the x-axis, the six weeks, each um, notch is a different week. And on the y-axis, we have the score in terms of total ADHD symptoms, hyperactivity and inattention on that y-axis. And you can see that both groups dropped in terms of their ADHD symptoms, but the group in the medium dosage dropped even more than the mild, uh, the lower dosage. They also did a CGI where they asked people majorly improved, moderately improved, a little bit improved, no change. And again, a responder is someone majorly improved or moderately improved. And 83% of the medium dosage was, was a responder, majorly improved or moderately improved, well, only 33% of the low dose group 
So the dose-dependent nature of the improvement here suggests that methylphenidate helps. And how about tolerability? The side effects were mild when they used long-acting stimulant medications. The um, only side effects that were seen that were different than when kids were starting the trial before they entered into the trial was that appetite decreased. We know this is a side effect of methylphenidate. And there was a mild but not clinically significant um, increase in heart rate. By that, I mean no one had to leave the trial because their heart rate was so fast that it was dangerous, that it was tachycardic. Um, and no one had to leave due to a side effect related to the medicine. That stands in contrast to one in four that had to leave when they used short acting. So that suggests that this might be a strategy that allows for stimulant medications to be more tolerable for more kids uh, with, a, with ADHD or hyperactivity with their autism. Um, I'll just mention here, I'm not going to talk about any studies here, but I can't talk about ADHD treatment without also talking about non-stimulants. These fall into two major classes, norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors. These medicines do the same thing as SSRIs, except just for norepinephrine, the neurotransmitter norepinephrine. And that has effects in the prefrontal areas of the brain to also affect dopamine. That's at least the theory behind how they work. They have the advantage of being once a day, all day long, or in the case of Stratera, and this new medicine, Kilbury, which is veloxazine that just came out, and that's a um, version of Stratera, a version of atomoxetine that actually can be opened and sprinkled on food, where atomoxetine used to need to be swallowed. So that opens up um, this medication class for kids who can't swallow capsules. And then alpha agonists. I mentioned these already, guanfacine and clonidine. These medications essentially do the opposite of the fight or flight response. And in that way, they're calming. You take them and you and feel more calm after you take them. And they're really most helpful for hyperactivity. Um, so a clinical approach here, methylphenidate and mixed amphetamine salts, which are stimulants, are first line. But if we're seeing side effects, irritability with those medications, or if there's a lot of irritability to begin with, we might start with a non-stimulant first, or we might think about starting with a long-acting version at very low dosages to see if we can have it be more tolerable. These are all kind of ideas to try and safely approach these medicines and help kids who have hyperactivity. Oof. All right, we're moving right along here. These next couple sections are a little bit more, a little bit more full with some uh, research trials we'll talk about. But first, we're going to talk about irritability. What do I mean by irritability? So Anna is 16. Uh, she has autism. She has gastroesophageal reflux disease, which is in well, in pretty well controlled with taking regular um, proton pump inhibitors. Uh, it really reduces acid, and she's doing well with her GERD. But the major concern is that of aggression towards parents and siblings. And the aggression and sometimes self-injury is occurring in the context of limit setting or non-preferred demands. Um, when things are asked of Anna, particularly around morning self-care or evening self-care routines, um, Anna quickly goes from zero to 100 in terms of her affect and her emotion. She goes to a really high intense level of anger, sometimes anxiety, but it's the quickness of the mood change that's the problem for Anna. And when she's in a heightened emotional state, it's very difficult for her to be safe. Um, if Anna was more verbal, it might've come along with threats to harm herself. Anna's not depressed. Between these meltdowns, her mood is good, actually. She's a happy kid. It's, be, it's in these episodes of meltdown where we see extreme anger, extreme emotional overwhelm, and she's really unsafe in these moments. Um, family are walking on eggshells around Anna. They don't really feel comfortable putting any demands on her. And at school, it's very difficult for her to make any, have any uh, demands placed on her either and make progress. Community trips are increasingly unsafe and it's getting in the way of peer interactions at school as well. So irritability here refers to the reactivity, the quickness of mood change, how quickly we go from zero to hundred, how often it happens and whether it comes along with unsafe behaviors. That's what's kind of meant by the term irritability when it's referred to in the literature on this. This is a really common cause for concern. And the research in Psychopharm 101 lecture that I gave, I discussed uh, one of the research trials, Risperidone, which found that antipsychotic medications can be extremely effective for this symptom. Why do medicines that treat schizophrenia help with mood reactivity in kids with autism? We actually don't know. We don't know why. We don't think that people are experiencing psychosis necessarily when they're having irritability. 
It just so happens that these medicines can be profoundly helpful for the quickness of mood change. And in that way, they are stabilizers of mood, mood stabilizers. They, they um, act by blocking the receptors on the nerves that bind to dopamine. And we don't know how that necessarily connects to irritability per se, but it can be profoundly effective uh, for kids and teens and adults, albeit at the cost of some really concerning side effects. Fatigue and constipation, the most common, and then the third most common, which is weight gain. Um, increased cholesterol, increased blood sugar, even in some rare cases, and uh, an increased weight. Um, and then a risk about one to 2% per year or so of um, uh, abnormal movements of the muscles um, that can come on in a delayed onset way and have a sort of writhing movement uh, to it, something called tardive dyskinesia. Tardive referring to sort of delayed onset and dyskinesia, sort of involuntary movement of the muscles. Not common, but an important thing to watch for. So there are real concerns about the usage of antipsychotic medications. Are there options that are not antipsychotics that can also help with irritability? Well, that's the trial I wanna talk with you about here, the next trial. And this is a study of Depakote, valproic acid, uh, or divalproix. It, it comes in a couple of different formulations. And this is actually an anti-seizure medication. It's not an antipsychotic medication. Um, and the observation that this medicine also helps with irritability in autism was born out of the fact that many people with autism have epilepsy. And uh, that certain anti-epileptic medications seem to help with stabilizing mood, and Depakote was one of them. And that led to this trial that was conducted in 2010, 27 subjects, these were kids, mean age of about nine to 10 years old, give or take two or three years. And it was a 12 week trial. There was a placebo group and then there was a treatment group, placebo controlled. And the dosing of it was starting at a low dosage around 250 milligrams a day, and then increasing it by about 250 or a little bit more than that if it was a, a, a larger weight kid until they reached a certain blood level. Depakote's a medication where everybody metabolizes it a little differently. So what's important is the level in someone's blood rather than the overall number of milligrams they're taking. And 50 micrograms per milliliter was the target they were going for. And then they went higher than that if they could, as long as it was tolerable. That's kind of the design of the trial. So what did they find? Here are the results over here on the left. And so you can see the, the duration of the trial. They have it followed out here to 15 weeks. Um, and then you have, that's the x-axis. And on the y-axis, you have this really commonly used irritability scale, the aberrant behavioral checklist, irritability subscale. And as you can see here, there was a significant difference in terms of the reduction in irritability in the blue line, the treatment group as compared to the control line. The improvement is there, although it's maybe not quite as robust as what we might remember from the trials of antipsychotics, but definitely a difference. They also did this thing of saying if someone majorly improved, moderately improved, you remember what I said on that, they did this for this trial too. And 62% of people taking Depakote were majorly improved or moderately improved as compared to only 10% of the placebo group. Uh, sorry, that says low dose group, that should be placebo group. So a definite difference in terms of whether someone was thought to be much improved or, or uh, moderately improved. So another positive trial showing improvement. How about tolerability? There were side effects with Depakote. And the side effects were uh, that people saw some weight gain with this medication. The weight gain in this trial was not as robust as it was with Risperdal and Abilify, the antipsychotic medications, but it wasn't zero. Subjects, some subjects had rash that was more in the treatment group than in the placebo group. Some individuals had more frequent urination, which is called polyuria. And um, uh, some subjects had agitation. Um, one subject needed to leave the trial because of agitation. Um, so while we don't think about this as being as common as with stimulant medications or SSRIs, that did happen to one individual in this trial, so it's important to watch for as well. And uh, Depakote's a medicine where you need to also check the health of the liver when you prescribe this medication. So blood tests are a requirement for taking this medication, but it is helpful to know that there are some medicines out there, not antipsychotics, that, have, that can really help with this. Um, so here we have clinical approach. While risperidone, aripiprazole can be first-line treatment, we know that Depakote is probably not far behind. We may even think about starting with that if we're trying to avoid any psychotics. And then I always remember Ziprazidone 
an antipsychotic medication, Giodon is the name for it, but one that is very rare, well, mom, fairly rare to cause uh, weight gain um, and uh, can also be really helpful on this issue. So it's the one that's the least likely to cause weight gain of really most things on this list here. So uh, an option to consider when weight gain is a concern. Now, what if medicines like Risperidone and Abilify, they really help. We can't find something else that works, but they're life changers, but they're causing weight gain. What can we do in that situation? Well, there was a study that looked at a medication called metformin. Metformin, you may have heard of. Metformin is a medication prescribed in people who have type 2 diabetes when they have the beginning stages of their type 2 diabetes. And what metformin does is it makes your body more sensitive to the natural insulin that your body makes. Insulin has a wide variety of effects in the body, but um, one of the most important effects is that it sort of changes how your body metabolizes calories to send the message to have the calories um, be sort of stored in the muscles rather than being stored as fat as much, essentially. And so when we become less sensitive to the natural insulin we make, more calories get stored as fat. Um, and it's a known observation in the type 2 diabetes world that when you start metformin, people can lose a little weight. So that was interesting to the schizophrenia research world, where they started metformin in people who had to take Risperdal for schizophrenia. And they found, wow, people with schizophrenia are losing weight with this medicine. What happens if we try it in autism? And so that was this trial. This is a trial done in 2016. It was a 16-week trial, double-blind placebo control, um, 60 um, subjects in total. These were kids, kids and teenagers that had autism. Um, and these were all people who specifically had weight gain with the uh, antipsychotic medicines. Um, they got better, but their BMI increased by about 7% in the first month of taking the medication. So they're already on a scary road in terms of weight gain, right? And so they, um, their study design is kids were going to start taking metformin at that point um, and try to get to a target dosage of 500 twice a day in younger kids or 850 twice a day in older kids. And their primary question was, is it tolerable for kids who have autism? And did it decrease the rate of weight gain? Remember that these kids are, they're, they're still kids. They're still growing. They're still naturally getting taller. So we expect them to gain weight because they're getting taller. But is it their BMI, is their BMI changing? Can we slow down the rate of BMI increase with this medicine? That was the question. So here are the results. So the Z-score is like the rate of change of BMI. That's what's meant by Z-score here. And what they found was that indeed metformin slowed down the rate of weight gain of uh, the, the BMI increase as compared to placebo. Um, and that there was um, uh, a uh, also a small percentage of individuals around 11% who not only slowed down their rate of weight gain, but they also dropped weight uh, related to it as well. Um, they went, uh, they had a, a drop in BMI of about eight to 9%. Um, and this change was not, this change wasn't apparent until about two months into the trial. So you got to sort of stick on metformin for a little while to know if it's going to work. All right. So it did show improvement for these individuals. How was the tolerability? The tolerability was actually quite good. Um, the side effect, the only side effect that differed compared to placebo is that people had GI symptoms. And this included diarrhea. It included flatulence, farting. It included um, stomach cramps. And one individual had, again, irritability and had to leave the trial. We don't know if maybe they were having GI symptoms and couldn't communicate it. Um, but the when I see this medicine need to be stopped, it's because of that particular thing, um, the issue of... Um, stomach cramps or diarrhea where we need to stop the medicine. This is also a medicine that in kids who have kidney failure needs to be dosed at a different level for kids who have kidney failure. So this is an option to consider. I don't like the idea of prescribing a medication to help with a side effect of another medication. So usually my first instinct is to try and see if we can change to something else. But in kids and teenagers and adults who can't change to something else or have a life-changing benefit, uh, with the medicine. Metformin can help them stick with medicine. One more trial I want to talk with you about as long as we're talking about irritability, and that is this trial, 124 kids with autism across the range of severity. And what they were interested in was adding 
um, essentially behavioral therapy, the concepts and ideas behind behavioral therapy delivered not like the traditional ABA system, but as a support to parents, something called parent management training, where parents are given ideas and tools around the ideas of um, using behavioral strategies. This might be as simple as like a first this, then that plan, where, you know, first we brush our teeth, then you get this reward on the other side, or it might be the usage of a visual chart, or it might be the usage of uh, coaching people around the usage of their communication assist device to ask for a break, all the different concepts and ideas of behavioral therapy, but the parents were empowered to do it themselves with connections with a behavioral therapist that they checked in with on a weekly basis. And they wondered whether adding this meant that people did even better than taking a medication. Or for people who were taking a medication, was there additional benefit if you added this to someone who was taking a benefit, taking a medication? And again, this is for irritability. That's the main thing we're looking to see improve. It's a 24-week trial. Um, and uh, people were randomized into combination parent management training, Risperdal, and then just the medicine, Risperdal, or Abilify, or neither into those different groups. And on average, parents got like um, about 10 sessions of parent management training. Here are the results. And what they found is there was definite superiority um, for the groups, the kids and teenagers who were getting both the medication and also the parent training, and that that was superior to just taking the medication. Not only that, those kids ended up on lower dosages of medications with having good benefit. And the parents felt that their home was a safer place. That's the home situations questionnaire. They felt their home was more safer and, and better in control than the parents who um, whose loved one was just taking medication. So it, again, it kind of highlights their, you know, behavioral therapy is not perfect. It carries its own um, challenges in terms of implementation, whether it's covered, uh, whether people can even get it and delivered. Um, and not everyone's a responder to behavioral therapy, but it highlights that as a prescriber, I should not just be thinking medicine, medicine, medicine. I should also be asking about behavioral therapy. And among the resources we have at the Lurie Center, we have um, uh, behavioral clinicians and um, a de uh, Nicole Simon runs a, a session on de-escalation um, uh, for loved ones with, a, uh, with autism who have significant irritability, like an information session on how to do de-escalation. So, you know, we try to approximate it as much as we can of providing some of these benefits at the Lurie Center. Uh, okay, home stretch now. In the last 10 minutes, I'm gonna talk a little bit about ritualized repetitive behavior. Um, and uh, how I think about this particular concern, because I put this among the top three most common concerns that parents come in with their, their loved one with autism, or maybe even an individual themselves with autism might have as a, as a concern that they bring up. What do I mean by this ritualized repetitive behavior? Well, let me give you an example and talk about Paul. Paul's 12. Paul has autism. He has epilepsy. He's been stable from his epilepsy for about four years now, but um, and he has intellectual impairment as part of his autism. He has, um, uh, I put here nonverbal. The reality is that Paul does have some uh, speech that he does, some echolalia, which is repeating certain phrases, some um, uh, ability to answer some simple questions, yes or no, although something more open-ended can be very hard for Paul. And the parent's main concern is that Paul has had an escalating need to move items from surfaces arrange chairs around um, the table that chairs need to kind of be just so. And if anything is sort of unexpected that's on this table surface or on the counter surface, he'll trash it. Trash, he'll trash loose paper. Um, he'll go into department stores and rearrange the displays, which you know they, they don't appreciate. Um, and it's hard to set limits on this because Paul is driven around these rituals, around ordering and arranging things and moving them just so. Paul can't talk about why he's doing it or you know, why it's a preference for him. Um, he doesn't seem like he doesn't want to do it necessarily, but boy, is he driven to do it. And in fact, Paul has recently been staying up late to do a lot of this ordering and arranging, and it's getting in the way of sleep for him. Attempts to set limit on, they've even resulted in some aggression or self-injury, or just bowling over the person who's kind of standing in the way. So parents come in, 
with saying Paul's OCD is out of control. And we might stop ourselves for a minute and just ask about how we understand this and how we might think about OCD and how we might think about repetitive phenomena on autism. So let's talk about comparing and contrasting, you know, um, the symptoms of OCD and the symptoms of autism. It can, it can be really tricky and I struggle with it myself. Obsessive compulsive disorder is characterized by obsessive thoughts. Obsessive thoughts are unwanted, they're recurrent, they're intrusive, they come on suddenly. The thought, maybe it comes along with an urge or an image in your head. It's unwanted, it's persistent. Um, and um, it oftentimes drives a compulsion. A compulsion is a repetitive behavior or a mental act. For some people with OCD, the compulsion might be to make a list in their mind. So it may not be a physical thing, but it might be a mental act. And compulsions are notably driven in response to the obsession. A classic example, I have a concern that the, my hands are contaminated in some way because I touched the counter surface. And so to address that intrusive thought that my hands are dirty, I've got to wash my hands. And when I've washed my hands, it doesn't quite feel right. Like, I don't know if I really made them clean. So I got to go back and wash it again. The next thing I know, I'm in a cleaning loop over and over again. You see that the compulsion is driven by an obsessive thought. What's the treatment for OCD? The treatment for OCD is SSRIs. We've talked about those already earlier on in our lecture. Um, these... Uh, uh, these can be very effective for OCD and something called exposure response prevention therapy. The idea behind this therapy is if it's the obsessive thought that's driving the compulsion, is it possible for people to little by little expose themselves for some of that obsessive thought and try to resist a little bit of the urge to do the compulsion and start in a little way where the obsession is not that bad and then move towards a bigger one. So an example of this might be if I had concern about contaminating my hands, I might start with something simple, like thinking about my hands being contaminated and move to something tough, like putting my hands on a toilet seat. So you're essentially creating an exposure hierarchy that exposes you to a little bit of that fear in a way that's controlled and then resists the urge to do the compulsion. And like running a marathon, little by little, you build your stamina to resist the urges. How is autism spectrum disorder repetitive phenomenon different? Ritualized behavior in autism is common. This can include stereotyped play or stereotyped movements. Um, classic examples, repetitive hand flapping or toe walking, but play can be also highly ritualized, watching something that spins over and over again, for instance. Restricted interests can kind of look like an obsessive thought. I have had uh, patients that um, had obsessions around um, planes or celebrities or... Um, uh, different items and they wanted to talk about them all the time. They wanted to read about them all the time. They wanted to, to, to learn about them all the time. And parents would say they were obsessed with it. It's an obsession, but not egodystonic, not unwanted, actually preferred. And need for sameness. So a lot of people with autism may have a real strong need for sameness. We want the bus to arrive exactly at 745. And if it's five minutes earlier, if it's five minutes later, that might be upsetting for them. It's part of the need for sameness. And it can look like OCD, um, but again, it's not driven by an obsessive thought beyond just wanting for things to be similar to how they were before. What's the treatment for this? Well, do SSRIs help? One would think if it's similar to o OCD that SSRIs would help. So what's the finding on this? The finding here, um, I'm actually gonna jump ahead and I'll come back to this slide, was a research trial that was done this is gonna be the last study I tell you about today, um, where they looked at an SSRI called citalopram to see if it would help with the repetitive phenomenon I was talking about with um, seen in autism spectrum disorder. And they started at low dosages, 150 kids, double blind placebo control trial, 12 weeks. And they found no difference in terms of improving repetitive behavior in autism. Not only that, they, had a, they saw a lot of adverse events. This is the trial I was telling you about before where many kids needed to leave the trial due to behavioral side effects. And some other things like increased stereotypy, diarrhea, insomnia, dry skin, puritis. So real concerns about tolerability of SSRIs and no improvement. In a follow-up to this, there were two other research trials that were done. One looking at Prozac, fluoxetine, another SSRI, 
and um, uh, well, two actually with Prozac specifically. And these were big trials and none of those trials have shown improvement in terms of repetitive behaviors. So this brings me back to one of the things I said at the beginning of the lecture, which is that it's really oftentimes not expected for medications to treat the core symptoms of autism spectrum disorder. We think about them as more helping with um, co-occurring other behavioral issues or other mental health diagnoses. When I give this lecture, usually there's a couple people in the audience who did see improvement with SSRIs, and that's great if that's the case. Um, it's wonderful in many ways because um, if someone can tolerate an SSRI, there aren't a lot of long-term side effects with it. Um, however, the research suggests that it's oftentimes not helpful. And I worry about over-prescribing of medications for kids with autism and, and teens and adults with autism too. And if this may be one area where we can actually reduce our prescribing for kids with autism and adults with autism and try to think about other treatments that can be more helpful. Uh, this stands in contrast to adults. There have been some small pilot trials that showed a little bit of improvement with some SSRIs, Prozac, Luvox, that's pro fluoxetine and fluvoxamine and a, an old antidepressant medication, clomipramine, that showed a little bit of improvement as compared to placebo. So there may be some reason to think about giving these a try in adults. Um, and so maybe I'll just take a step back to the previous slide. How can we tell the difference between OCD and repetitive phenomena on autism? I still struggle with it, to be honest with you. It can be really hard. This was a research trial that I really like to reference that took individuals that had obsessive compulsive disorder and individuals that had autism, classic autism. And what they did is they asked them about symptoms of OCD. These were all the different ways in which OCD could manifest. And they asked individuals with OCD and individuals with autism and their caregivers. And what they found is they found real differences. So I'll, I'll walk you through this slide here. And in this slide on the top part, you see the bar graph and it shows obsessive thoughts. That's the obsessions part of OCD. And you'll see that obsessive thoughts in general are way more common in the cross hatched bars, that's people with OCD, than the open bars, that's people with autism. So in general, fears around contamination, fears about whether I'll do something aggressive or sexually inappropriate, fears around the need for symmetry, these and then obsessive thoughts in general, driving the compulsions were way less common. And when it came to compulsions themselves, repetitive behaviors, what, here's what they found. They found that repetitive cleaning behaviors, repetitive checking behaviors, that's checking for safety. Did I leave the oven on? Did I close the window to prevent robbers from coming in? You know, checking things to make sure they're safe. Did I um, put the knives away? Um, those were the compulsions that were seen more in OCD as compared to ordering and arranging, hoarding behaviors, um, repetitive touching or tapping, self-injury. Those were the repetitive behaviors seen more in autism. So that means if I'm trying to distinguish OCD and wondering whether SSRI makes sense, I ask about are there obsessive thoughts? And in people who can't talk about their thoughts, I ask about are there repetitive cleaning compulsions or checking for safety? That kind of can help me distinguish a little bit whether it's classic OCD that might get better with an SSRI or whether I should be thinking about it as more the repetitive features of autism. So what do we do if it's the repetitive features of autism? Here's how I think about it. I try to maximize behavioral therapies. Um, if behavioral therapy is helpful for someone, can I advocate for it more? It's not helpful for everybody, but for, for, for people that it is, it can really reduce this. So I'll give you an example. For Paul, Paul had a lot of his ritualized behavior around his morning routine, his um, sort of uh, breakfast and things like um, getting dressed for the day. He would stop and start and do a ritual. And, and so they instituted a timer to try and if, if Paul got through that part of the morning routine, there was something he'd earn at the end of the timer. Or they added structure that came with a, a visual schedule where Paul would do this and then he would do this and he would check off each step along the way. It added nice structure to that morning routine and it reduced ritualized behavior. Also structure in general, it doesn't need to be a behavioral therapy, but with more open-ended time, it can be filled with more repetitive behavior. I saw that around COVID when school was closed, when a lot of ritualized behavior increased. So these are some non-medicine ideas that can help. Also, there's some evidence that if you treat co-occurring mental health issues that are there, like hyperactivity or irritability, you can really reduce repetitive behaviors. Your um, 
uh, Paul was staying up late to do a lot of the rituals. So ensuring that Paul got good sleep by starting melatonin for him meant that he was doing the rituals less because he was sleeping instead. It was harder for Paul to resist the urge to do sleep. And with a lot of rituals, it's kind of like the more you do them, the more you do them. So just reducing the amount of time that Paul was doing them, they kind of got a little less dense. The parents also worked to kind of decide which rituals were really important to stop and which were actually okay for Paul to have. They were not really getting in the way of Paul's life. And allowing Paul to have some agency over his life is important too. So they really tried to pick the rituals that really got in Paul's way. Um, and then in adults, Paul's not an adult, in adults it may be worth considering an SSRI. If you're going to continue consider an SSRI in a kid for this particular issue, it's important to go in with open eyes and come off of it if it's not helping and hold yourself to a high standard to say if it really if it really helps. Okay, I think I went over by a couple minutes, but I will finish there so I can leave some time for questions. Um, here's the research line. If you're, all this is born out of research, if you're interested in research and participating in moving things forward, um, uh, if, if possible, then um, and reach out to us and let us know. Uh, I'll take some questions now. Hi, Dr. Curie. Um, we do have a request if you could talk about the options of Lamictal and um, uh, Closeril. Lamictal and Closeril. Closeril was the medication. Awesome. Yeah. Okay, um, so lamotrigine is on the one hand kind of similar to Depakote, which I talked about. This is a anti-seizure medication that can have mood stabilizing qualities. It is um, milder in its effect than Depakote, which means we're maybe a little less optimistic that it'll help with severe irritability. But it's a reasonable thing to consider where irritability is a problem, it's present, but it's not so severe that we can't, um, give it a try. One of the problems with lamotrigine is it takes a while to get to the correct dosage. You have to move slowly with lamotrigine because it can, in rare cases, cause a rash if you move too quickly. So you have to be able to say, okay, I'm investing about six weeks, <laughs> four to six weeks into giving this a try. So if you can wait that long and you're not in crisis, then lamotrigine is a reasonable thing to try. It's just we have to keep in mind that it's not been studied like Depakote has been. But wow, is it tolerable. It's probably the most tolerable anti-seizure medicine. Okay, now let's move to Clozeril. Clozeril, the other name for that, clozapine, is an antipsychotic medication. And clozapine has a claim for fame for being the most effective treatment out there for schizophrenia by a long shot. It's a really effective medicine for people who cannot get stable any other way for their schizophrenia. Can it also help with irritability and autism? Well, it's a bit of an unknown quantity. It hasn't been studied yet. Part of the reason it hasn't been studied is because um, it can cause white blood cells to go low. And for that reason, if people are going to start Clozeril, they have to get a blood draw once a week. And that's hard for a lot of people with autism. That's a hard trial to design. So it's not been studied, but it needs to be. We, our group looked at a particular um, group of individuals that got better with catatonic symptoms. This is like freezing episodes where people were not responsive. That can happen in autism. In fact, it's, it's um, unfortunately, um, a not uncommon manifestation that you can see, particularly in people that have a um, profile of autism that includes some intellectual disability and very severe need for sameness in rituals. Um, and what we found is clozapine was remarkably helpful for those people when they became catatonic. So that's a new frontier. It needs to be studied more, but it could be very helpful for those people who can tolerate the blood draws. So we have lots of questions. We're only going to have time for a couple more. Um, okay. We had a question about, um, are any of these um, medicines addictive? Mm. So none of the medications I talked about today are habit-forming or addictive in any way. But there are some psychiatric medications that can be. These, um, well, actually, I should take a step back. I, um, I'm going to give a caveat to what I just said. But before that, Ativan, Valium, um, uh, Clonopin, are the ones that immediately come to mind to me as being some of the most habit forming when it comes to the treatment of anxiety because people feel a real difference related to it. But I need to correct myself because I told you something wrong. I told you none of the medicines I talked about today carry any risk of habit forming. And that's not true. The stimulant medications that I talked about carry a risk for being habit forming. And I'm glad the question came up because I didn't talk about that as a risk. That's could be a blind spot for me as a clinician that works with people with autism where 
people who have intellectual disability as part of their autism are less likely to have addiction because they've got the protection of someone administering the medicine for them. But for people who have autism um, and that doesn't have as often intellectual disability, we do have to watch for the risk that people can have euphoric reactions to taking stimulant medicines. It's rare, it's under 3% of individuals that develop euphoria and then misuse the medication in order to get high, essentially in order to get euphoric, but it's not impossible. And so it does need to be discussed, particularly starting around the 11, 12, 13 year old time period. Um, and then there can also be misuse of stimulants, not addiction, but using it to, um, saving it up and then taking more than is prescribed in order to study hard for a test or sharing it with a friend. This misuse is not addiction, but it's dangerous. And in fact, it can be, it's more common than addiction. So that's another important thing that needs to be discussed with stimulant medications. So nice question. Um, yeah, next question. Um, are, do you have any concerns about Depakote for young women? Yes, another good question here. So the question that was brought up here has to do with the risk for something called polycystic ovarian syndrome. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a potential risk when it comes to Depakote, and that um, can have effects on the menstrual cycle. It can cause abnormal hair growth. So it's important when moving forward with Depakote to consider this side effect. Well, it's not common, it absolutely can be seen. The other concern that's important to think about in young women who take Depakote is that this is a medication that can uh, be a, what's called a teratogen. So if women become pregnant while taking Depakote, it can do damage to the fetus and actually cause autism. It's actually one of the medications that can cause autism. So if someone is of um, childbearing age and they are sexually active, they should either not be taking Depakote at all, or they should be really thinking about an effective um, birth control uh, method um, and with a discussion with their um, gynecologist. Um, some anti-seizure medications can make birth control not effective and be teratogenic. So anti-seizure medications should be discussed in uh, women of childbearing age who are sexually active. And we are actually out of time. Oh, hmm. um, I, uh, those are some really good questions and help cover up some important issues that I didn't bring up. So I really thank and appreciate those questions.